I'm Joe Hammond. I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I study uh, the impacts of climate change on the water cycle. Um, I'm a water resource engineer by training, and so I'm interested in things that kind of interface climate and the water cycle with the um, water resource systems. Uh, I am also a core developer of the X-Ray Project. I started working on the X-Ray Project when I was a PhD student at the University of Washington. Um, for the last five years or so, I've been helping out with that project. And uh, the Pangeo Project kind of uh, spawned out of the uh, a group of uh, core users and developers of the X-Ray Project. And so um, kind of by default, I became one of the founding members of the Pangeo Project as well. I should mention, if it, there's going to be a couple times where I tell you to do something on your laptop. You don't have to, but if you have your laptop with you, you might open it up, um, connect to the Wi-Fi, whatever. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about big data in the geosciences. And in, um, in my field, as a hydrologist, uh, we, um, ha we take observations of the Earth. Um, on the left here are two satellites, the um, SMOS and SMAP satellites. Uh, they take images, or they provide images of uh, the water cycle that we can use to gain some understanding in the Earth system. I'm more of a computational modeler, so I um, develop um, computational models that simulate the uh, function of the water cycle. So on the right, I'm showing an example simulation of monthly stream flow over the continental U.S. And I think if I press a button or two would start playing, it's not gonna happen. It's, anim it's an animation. Animations don't seem to be working here today. It, did, did it play? No, okay. Great, I don't know why that happened. But so um, anyways, the idea is that uh, we uh, can, you know, through a process of un trying to understand the system using observations, we can develop a conceptual and a computational model that simulates the Earth system. And these two th processes where we take observations and we develop a model and run a simulation and then we evaluate that with our observations is really uh, central to how we do um, a lot of uh, the science in our field. And when these two work together, you know, we make progress in our science and when they, when, uh, when they don't work together, we stop making progress. And the argument we're making is that with the uh, you know, kind of explosion of uh, data volumes, both from observations and from, uh, from model-based data sets, we're really starting to, the, the gears are starting to grind. And the progress we're making is slowing at the same time um, as these new data sets are coming online. There's a lot of potential there. So as a way to illustrate that, I have a few um, nice graphs. Uh, on, the, on the left side, I'm showing the uh, growth of NASA projected cloud storage of their satellite missions. So they're moving a lot of data to AWS. And this graph basically shows that NASA, um, you know, within seven years from now, is expecting to have uh, about 300 petabytes of satellite mission data stored on AWS. So 300 petabytes, I think we can all agree, is big data. Um, if you are, in, are familiar with the climate sciences domain, you've likely heard of the CMIP archive, the coupled model intercomparison uh, project, and uh, this is showing the growth of the CMIP archives over the years. The uh, y-axis is um, logarithmic and bytes, and I've kind of highlighted the one petabyte mark. Uh, CMIP 5, which was released about seven years ago now, uh, hit about 3.3 petabytes in total size. CMAP 6 is being developed now. It could be anywhere from you know, 20 petabytes on up to low hundreds. And these are good things. These, the growth of these data sets mean we're doing science and we, uh, there's a lot of information in these data sets, but, when, uh, but we really need tools that allow us to <coughs> interrogate these data sets effectively. So what is Pangeo? Pangeo is a community of people working to develop the software and infrastructure uh, necessary to enable big data geoscience. So it's a fairly broad umbrella and it's uh, slightly amorphic uh, and that's intentional. Our mission is really just to cultivate an ecosystem uh, in which we can have open source tools that work with big data in the geosciences. The uh, scientific 
Python ecosystem is some, you know, this slide gets shown like 20 times at this conference every year. Uh, this is one is slightly tuned to the geosciences, um, but these are a series of Python packages that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And in, uh, in Pangeo right now, we're focusing on uh, really improving the integration of these packages, particularly the, the three packages I'm going to talk about today um, are the um, Jupyter, X-Ray, and Dask packages. So we've actually heard um, in the first talk this morning uh, mentioned kind of all three of these. So at the, the core, one of the core concepts of, um, of Pangeo is that we have a uh, data approximate architecture. And what I mean by that is that uh, we're, we are really trying to make an effort to develop the tools and know-how to move our um, computations to where the data lives. We're, we're moving to a new paradigm where uh, we can't download data sets anymore. So we have to do the compute where the data lives. And the, the vision we have for this is that um, we would use very similar tools to what we use today, um, but we would uh, do the, that computation on, um, um, on hardware where the data lives. So here's, here's I'll just walk through this, um, this architecture diagram. You might have an end user sitting on their laptop, like my laptop here. I'm going to connect to a Jupyter notebook through my web browser. And then running on my uh, either cloud or HPC compute system, I might have my Python ecosystem. So in, in, our, in my case, I use X-Ray and Dask a lot together. That might be slightly different for you. Uh, that's fine. Um, but attached to that um, cloud or HPC system should be some high performance, parallel access, distributed um, storage system. And when we have all these things together, we have a data approximate platform for doing big data geoscience. So I'm going to just briefly touch on the th those three packages, um, hopefully to give a kind of broad overview of what the um, environment might look like. So uh, X-Ray is a package for doing n-dimensional array analysis uh, in Python. Uh, it builds on top of um, a series of Python packages that uh, that you might be familiar with already, pandas, numpy, matplotlib. And what distinguishes X-Array from, say, numpy would be its use of labels. So um, we use coordinates and dimension names that uh, are meaningful to the data set. And um, it, it, the key thing that allows us to do out-of-core computation, and I'll talk about more, more in a bit, is that um, we, don't, we don't just use NumPy under the hood. We can also swap out those NumPy arrays for Dask arrays and um, support. Somebody really wants in. <laughs> um, so we can support out-of-core computations using Dask. It has um, some really nice functionality for uh, reading and writing a bunch of different file formats, so NetCDF, HDF. Um, I'm going to show an example in a bit using the, uh, a new file format called ZAR. And then it has a... <laughs> All right. We're okay. <laughs> We're okay. He got in. Okay, so moving on from X-Ray. So uh, Dask uh, needs more than one slide, but you'll just get one slide here today. Uh, Dask is a flexible uh, parallel computing library for analytic computing in Python. And uh, we largely use the Dask Array module that um, basically allows us to take a, um, a single n-dimensional array and um, chunk it in um, some user-defined pattern. And then Dask handles um, defining the um, chunked operations on that. So on the right, you're looking at a Dask task graph um, doing some operations on um, on an array, and Dask actually handles the scheduling of execution of different um, operations on individual chunks. Then, of course, I think most of you in the room are familiar with Jupyter, where uh, it's a web application that allows for interactive data analysis. Uh, it mainly supports Python, but there's 40 other plus kernels that it works with. In a minute, I'm going to show an example using Jupyter Hub, which is a multi-user server for um, Jupyter Notebooks. And we can put these um, Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Notebook interfaces on a variety of hardware. So you can run the, them on your laptop, you can run them on your HPC system, you can run them on the cloud. Uh, so they're really portable and they provide a really convenient, uh, stable um, interface that we can move around. Okay, so but you can build your own Pangeo if you like. 
Um, so like I said, we are mostly focusing on DASC and X-ray and Jupiter, uh, but that's not the only workflow that should be possible here. So um, you kind of pick and choose which components of uh, all of, you know, I'm showing a few examples here, storage formats, ND arrays, data models, processing modes, compute platforms that make sense for you. Um, and the key here is that we want the, these tools to be interoperable. So we should be able to use, say, Pandas with uh, Jupyter, which we can, uh, Pandas with Dask, okay, that works too, um, and so on and so forth. So we've been testing out this idea. Uh, we have um, deployed what we're calling a Pangeo, uh, which is really just the connection of uh, um, this ecosystem um, for uh, big data applications uh, in a number of places. So we've uh, HPC systems, so NASA's Pleiades and uh, NCAR's Cheyenne supercomputers are shown here on the left. We've also deployed uh, Pangeo Jupyter Hubs on Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, AWS. And so we're really getting to the place now where where these really big data sets live, we can do um, consistent analysis uh, workflows. So just to highlight a few things here, uh, if you're an HPC user, um, so I, I work at NCAR, I use the Cheyenne supercomputer all the time, I wanna be able to use the same uh, workflow uh, there. So we've been developing a new package called Dask Job Queue that allows us to easily deploy Dask distributed on, uh, on um, HPC systems that use job queuing software like PBS or Slurm or SGE. Um, and it has this really nice high level um, Python interface. So I just import Dask Job Queue and it um, allows me to manage my, my PBS submissions um, on, on um, from within a Python interpreter. So check that out, it's a new, it's a new package. Um, I think it, we're finding that it's quite useful. So at this point, um, I'm gonna say if you want to, you can go to pangeo.pydata.org um, where I'll do a quick demonstration. We'll see if it works. Um, but while you go there, I'll just uh, say a few things. So on uh, Google Cloud Platform, we're running a Jupyter Hub server. Uh, it's a zero to Jupyter Hub Kubernetes deployment. Um, with um, some special handling to allow us to deploy Dask via Dask Kubernetes. Uh, it, um, you know, we can go into this more maybe during questions of kind of why we're interested in the cloud, but in short, uh, you know, the cloud off offers a highly scalable um, storage, compute, user access environment. It's really easy to customize, and uh, for the compute at least, it's super cost effective. So I'm gonna actually click on, not click on this link, but you can go to pangeo.pydata.org. You can, uh, it's open access right now. Uh, sign in with GitHub, uh, that's how you'll authenticate. Um, and a um, bunch of disclaimers about like, we may not leave it up forever, so don't do all of your most core science there. It's not super secure, all of that sort of thing. Let's see if I can get, um, for now, I've now ruined it. Let's see, can anybody? Uh-oh, I need to go back to this. Yeah. Nope, I'm in trouble. I'm not gonna be able to do that very well. All right, we're gonna give this one more shot. Okay, I'm gonna give up on this because I can't seem to get my, uh, the screens to switch back. Let's see here. Yeah, except I can't get my mouse over to this one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the resolution is so high. Oh, here we go. Okay. There we go, okay. There we go. You all can see that now. So I've already signed in. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulty there. Lost mouse. So um, what I have here is a Jupyter Lab session running on Google Cloud. If you uh, log in, it'll take a minute to spin up a Kubernetes pod for you, but eventually you'll get um, a Jupyter Lab session. So Jupyter Lab is just kind of the next generation of the Jupyter Notebook. So most of this should look familiar to you even if you're more familiar with the Jupyter, the standard Jupyter Notebook interface. 
And here I just have normal, no, normal Python code. So I'm going to import X-Array. I'm going to um, deploy um, Dask using the Dask Kubernetes cube cluster here. I already run this, so I won't run it again. Um, and then I'm going to connect to that client. And what you see here is that um, by uh, deploying the, this, I have a minimum. I've told Dask I want a minimum of 20 workers and a maximum of 60. And so I'm sitting here with 20 workers um, ready to do some analysis. So I'm just going to walk you through an example of uh, where I'm going to analyze some meteorology data of precipitation and temperature over the continental US. And I'm going to do a couple operations on this data set that I, you know, I might do routinely in my, in my research. I'm doing this on Google Cloud, though, and um, I'm doing this so there'll be large parallel operations that happen here. So the first thing I'm going to do is open a ZAR data set. So DAR, ZAR is a distributed chunked um, array data set format um, that we've been playing around with within Pangeo, and it's supported as um, one of the uh, backends for X-Ray. So um, I'm talking here to the Google Cloud um, storage, and in a second here, provided that we're still connected. This is what always happens with live demos. Exactly. All right. Maybe all of my clicking around earlier really broke it. So I'll just walk through this really quickly. Hopefully this um, things kick in and start working again for us. Um, the idea is that I can write normal Python code, just like I would on a small data set, except in this case I can work with a much, um, much larger data set. So this, uh, if this prints out, it's going to tell you this is about 500 gigabytes in size. So it's not massive, but it's also um, it's taking much longer than normal, so we are going to start over. No, it, it doesn't. So, um, yeah, okay, we're working again here. So, coming, coming back to this. Um, no, it, so, okay, yes. So, uh, yay, all I needed to do is restart. So, uh, here is an x ray data set. There's a bunch of variables here uh, pre precipitation, T max, T min, these are daily va values over the continental US. And it's 450 gigabytes. Just to give you an idea, this is what the elevation um, would look like. Um, Come up here, I'll just pull up this task dashboard. I think now you all have, I'm guessing a few of you have taken this and you have just taken my pods because I had to restart. So it might not run. Um, I encourage you to go there and do this. I'm going to finish my talk so that I don't just spend some time debugging code with you. Um, but we'll, I'll, I'll come back here at the end. We'll see if it ran. Um, hopefully you get the idea that um, I'm just doing normal x-ray operations using Dask, but I'm doing it on Google Cloud, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm back. So I, I wanted to end with a few of the challenges that we're facing. So the first um, was that, uh, the first I wanted to, thing I wanted to mention was that uh, current challenges uh, in sh sh storing and sharing data on the cloud, it's just a new, new space for us. We, we, uh, in dimensional data is kind of the, the one thing that hasn't been sorted out. Um, if you're doing kind of raster formats, you have cloud-optimized geotiffs. If you're doing CSVs, you have things like Parquet or, um, you know, there's a, there's a host of options there. Um, but what we uh, are, are really interested in is in-dimensional data sets, so things that kind of look like a NetCDF HDF file. Finding, we're finding that managing multiple deployments is difficult. So um, and that's mostly because having a deployment to where the data lives and in, when the data is in multiple places, you have to manage multiple things. And so um, that can be difficult. And there's a whole, kind of a new space of um, managing user and admin controls when um, we're deploying these things. Um, specifically to the cloud idea, to the cloud concepts, uh, there's cultural challenges just surrounding the, um, you know, how the geoscience community already does th uh, their workflow. And so there's kind of well-established workflows that exist, and we're kind of advocating for something new, and that you know that causes some friction. And then there's a whole, you know, it's necessary to kind of understand the costs of, of um, and, and re kind of rethinking what 
cost for storage and computing and all of that comes down to. Okay, so how to get involved. Um, we have a website up here at the top, um, pangeo-data.org. That has examples of um, how to deploy these things. Maybe you have your own HPC system. Maybe you want to do one of these on your own cloud deployment. Um, you can uh, access pangeo.pydata.org um, at your leisure. So we've kept it up since uh, December. You're welcome to go um, give it a try. Tell us what you think. Um, try to build some of your own science into it. Um, try to adapt some of these elements to your own use case. Uh, obviously, we uh, strongly advocating participating in the open source software development. So all of us are, or many of us are contributors to packages like X-Ray and Dask and, um, and so on. We have a um, birds of a feather session in this room at one o'clock. Um, if you're interested in any of these things that I've thrown out there, please come and chat. So I'll, I'll mention that uh, some of the Pangeo effort has been um, supported by an NSF EarthCube award. So this is our EarthCube team. This is funded kind of a lot of the um, current momentum that we have. Um, so NCAR and Anaconda uh, are um, on that, and then uh, the team at Columbia is really leading that effort. Beyond the EarthCube team, there's actually a much broader um, group of people that have been contributing. So there's people from the Met Office. The, you know, our logo came from the Met Office, and they actually have been super helpful in doing a lot of the cloud deployment stuff. Um, folks from USGS and NASA and um, Early on, when we were just getting the Jupiter Hub stuff spun up, the um, folks from the um, Jupiter team at Berkeley were also super use useful uh, contributors. So I think that's my last slide, so I'll leave it there, and I may even jump back to the Jupiter Hub and see if it worked. So. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Hi. Um, so I'm in it, like I'm in this community and I'm really interested in Pangeo. I guess I'm looking for a little more information, like I use NetCDF, I use X-Array, I run numerical models, and um, I use Pandas sometimes for other stuff too. What should I be thinking of looking toward Pangeo for integrating? Since, like you said, it's a little abstract, I'm looking for like a little bit more um, tangibleness to grab onto so I can get, get more into it. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So it sounds like you already do a lot of what we do, and, and that's kind of part of the idea, is that what um, our piece is that we're really trying to uh, streamline the process of taking the workflow that you already use and allowing you to scale that to larger, larger applications. So some of that, you're, you may already, some of those improvements might be eking their way into X-Ray already, and you might just gain access to those. Um, some of those things, like new ways to deploy Dask on an HPC system, um, are coming down the pipe through things like Dask Job Queue. So um, it, I guess you should be looking for us for kind of those big data application performance improvements um, and, uh, and the ability to kind of scale along that continuum. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. I was curious about when you're running at this scale on hosted architecture with this much data, like what kind of workflows people have for creating derived data sets that they can save back and like use later or reference later, yep. uh, if you have anything about that. So uh, would you just, can you hand it back to him really quick? What do you mean by hosted data sets, just so we're clear? Well, or since, hosted, since hosted, you're running hosting. online, some people aren't working locally. Yeah, and, I understand, and yeah. Kind of will want, we'll want to come back to something later, maybe. Sure. Yeah, so I can speak to how I personally work. So on an HPC system, I can read data. I can also easily write it back to some parallel file system, and, and so that works. On the cloud, we're kind of still sorting that out. So right now, you all have access to read data from our Google Cloud buckets or from any bucket that you have access to, but that doesn't mean you're going to have access to write to those since we kind of pay for them. So um, we, we're giving you free computing. Hopefully, that's enough. Um, but so that's something we're working out. So you know, a lot of times we're doing the um, write once, read many analysis pattern, where you know, think like the CMIP archive is like mostly a data reduction um, operation. So um, yeah, we, that's something that's like we're still really interested in. 
I can easily take like a Zar data set or an X-ray data set and write it to a Zar format inside of a Google Cloud bucket or something like that. So those things happen. It's just a kind of user control issue. Hi. Um, so coming back to the the question of you're giving away free compute, and I imagine this is mostly a demo thing. That's yeah, probably yeah. not the long term plan. No. Uh, so we what is know. the long term plan for this kind of stuff? Or planning on packaging things so that it's um, easier to, to deploy or just working on the individual pieces to make them better? Yeah, so um, it's a little bit of both. It, it, it's probably not the long-term plan for us on the Pangeo EarthCube team to ma manage a community uh, deployment of Pangeo kind of everywhere. Um, but uh, it's, we want to make it really easy for you to do that. So if you have a research group at wherever you work, um, it should be kind of a handful of copy and paste lines or whatever, and you have a Kubernetes deployment of this running where you want it. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, who knows, maybe funding agencies like NASA and NSF say, we actually want those, like we'll sponsor those because we see that our community really does that. You know, so NSF pays for the Cheyenne supercomputer and you know, that's their portal for people to do computing um, at NCAR. Maybe they would do the same on AWS. So that's a that's a lo long arc idea. Did you did you want to show your uh, that your yeah okay so it, <laughs> was that your question? No. <laughs> so okay, uh, it's we're we're up and running now. Um, I did have to restart things, but um, so I just quickly walk you through this. What I have this um, data set that's an ensemble of meteorology. So there's nine ensemble members. Then there's latitude and longitude dimensions, and then a, a time dimension of daily data for like 30 years. And what I'm interested in, in this case, is the inner ensemble range. Um, so I'm gonna take the min minimum and maximum along the on ensemble dimension, and then I'm gonna um, uh, calculate that spread. So that's what I do here in a few lines of um, X-ray code, and then, so I'm taking this 450 gigabyte data set, and um, I'm telling Dask to persist that to the cluster so it'll, it stays distributed. And after a few seconds of running, I ended up with a map here that was the inner ensemble spread of um, team, uh, the, the mean daily temperature. And I'll just point out that there's a few kind of blotches that you see, and those are actually bugs in version one of this data set that this analysis brought to light. So it's, um, you know, that, that analysis hadn't really been done until it was really easy to crank through a 450 terabyte data set. And it's actually a 100 ensemble member data set. We only have nine of them here, but, um, you know, we can do this on four and a half terabytes too. So Rich, real question. Uh, yeah, actually, it's just sort of a plug actually for the HPC part of this because a lot of people say, oh, this cloud stuff is really cool, but you know, we don't have an account there. We can't, you know, transform all our data into ZAR. It's all in that CDF locally, blah, blah, blah. But installing this HPC, the instructions are really good. And you know, you don't need the, any admin or anything. You just create this environment and fire it off and it works. It's amazing. So if you have HPC, just try it out. I'm okay. super buzzed to see the Dask PBS thing. That, that now has paid for this conference for me. <laughs> good, um, good. Glad to hear it. Uh, this is actually another HPC question. Um, institutionally, what kind of issues did you face? Like, we have one where they delete all our data every 30 days on HPC. <laughs> so, um, what have you, you know, I know the queuing one, but anything else? Um, let's see. I mean, there's always lots, right? Like, system administrators really try to keep things in a box. Um, Nothing that's coming to mind right now. So, I mean, we're using kind of a Conda install of Python so we can manage our own environments. And then it's really kind of working out what the right configuration is for your specific system. And so Dask Job Queue allows you to package that up into a nice little line. But, um, yeah. There's one more question here that I saw. I'm about there. to say, find a new institution. <laughs> Um, I have a cloud data access question for yep. all of these massive geo data sets. Um, so for, was it Earth on AWS or anything that was mentioned before, are these data sets being stored in S3 or EBS? Because if it's in S3, then I still have to pay to transfer all of that massive, that massive data set over to a compute instance, which then gets pricey. 
Right, so uh, I think most of them are on S3, and you should be able to, from the same region, read them uh, for free and do operations on them. Um, so th I think that's the model that Amazon's pushing for. And so, um, yeah, so, and we have um, a few uh, deployments of Pangeo on AWS now that people are starting to play with. You know, one of the challenges, so there's like a bunch of geotiffs up there that, are, that would probably work right out of the box if you're doing satellite analysis. But they also dumped like a bunch of NetCDF files. But so that, there's like challenges there with kind of reading f data that's stored in a file format but stored in object store. And that's one of the things that were kind of, that was what I was hitting at with the storage and sharing mm -hmm. challenge at the moment, so. Okay, can we thank the speaker again? And if, um,